Good evening. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the uh, Artists on Artists lecture series. I'm Jasmil Raymond, the curator and organizer of this program. It is a pleasure um, to see you all here tonight and so many familiar faces. Welcome. Our lecture series this year is dedicated to the memory of Bradford Ray's DS trustee from 2002 to 2010. I would like to begin by acknowledging his generosity and commitment to DIA, and in particular to the Artists on Artists lecture series. I would also like to thank the C Foundation and the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs for their generous support. And closer to my desk, I would like to give thanks to my colleagues, Jean Dreskin, Patrick Hellman, and Ashley Tickle um, for their essential help in coordinating this program. The Artists and Artists Lecture Series begins as an invitation, a very casual invitation, where we say to an artist, come and talk about a peer, a person that you admire that is in Diaz's collection. And when I saw Daniel's work for the first time, I thought, oh, he's the right one. He, he probably can talk about Blinky Palermo. <laughs> well, it turns out that um, he picked somebody else from Diaz's collection. Imic novel, and it was not a surprise when I went to his studio, I understood. Um, they both share a fascination with Masonite, <laughs> among other materials, but also there was something really striking in that both of them navigate this ambiguity in that they make paintings that, no, uh, they make objects that look like paintings, and then they make pictures that look like sculptures. <laughs> so it's really in this mind twerp that both Amy and Daniel um, share uh, more than just materials in common. And I was really seriously struck by our conversation in the studio and the things that it came from, from that discussion in that it is fascinating to see a practice that today continues to ask very serious questions about what it is to make an object and how to go about making it. And I think in that regard, both of them um, are like meant for each other. Um, Daniel has held several, several group shows and his work has been included in, in a few solo exhibitions. Most recently, Gallery Luis Campagna in Berlin, Sutton Lane in London, Gallery Meteran in Sands in Zurich, and of course in New York at Taxter and Spengelman. Um, he will be having a solo exhibition this winter there as well, and um, we're very pleased to have him early in the season to be our premier speaker for the artists and artists. So please help me welcome him to, to the night here. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Jasmil, and, and thank you, everyone uh, at DIA, um, and thanks for coming out. And it's raining, and you came anyway, and it's Monday night. Um, <clears throat> my talk this evening is called Evie at a one-to-one -one scale. Um, now, <clears throat> composite wood, uh, also called engineered wood or man-made wood, includes a wide variety of derivative wood products. Uh, engineered wood is manufactured by binding together wood particles or veneers uh, using chemical adhesives such as urea formaldehyde resin. Uh, now, in 1938 uh, was the, is when engineered wood um, became a trademark across industry um, and uh, it achieved this kind of generic, highly standardized uh, status as a material commodity um, or what would later be called specific. Um, now, with the rise of World War II, engineered wood um, became an essential war material. And you can see uh, plywood is used to face um, this uh, housing. And here's more military housing. And this, this uh, use of plywood was ramped up and uh, continued into the expansion of the suburban American suburbs. Right? And um, <clears throat> now, the two main types, as just mentioned, on the left here is fiberboard. And this is particularly masonite brand fiberboard. And you're all familiar with plywood. 
on the right. <clears throat> now, fiberboard is, used, is mostly made of sawdust and glue. And here's the manufacturing process. Uh, so these, this video is from the IKEA factory. Um, and you can see the logs being loaded. And the very first thing, the very first part of the process is these logs are just fed through a giant wood chipper. Um, and IKEA makes a lot of Billy bookcases, it seems. Um, the next step is to combine these wood chips with sawdust. And this is, they're building chipboard. Uh, so it's a little bit different than Masonite. Um, here's a nice little sawdust rundown I thought you guys might appreciate. Uh, the next step is to dry out the composite wood. And here it's heated up to 800 degrees. <clears throat> and then the resin is mixed together. And here's, you have the formaldehyde, the water, ammonia, some hardener. And all of it is um, spun around at very high speeds because they want to coat every single particle of the, board, of the chips uh, with resin so that when it's compressed, okay, it adheres together into, and here it's compressed to about two inches into these massive boards. Uh, and the second to final step is they're loaded onto this giant conveyor belt uh, to cool down after this intense process. And finally, they're sh cut and shipped off, okay? Um, the result is a board with a kind of all over composition um, where, and here is chipboard, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> um, here is chipboard, and here is a close up of masonite. Now, plywood has a very different relationship to nature. Uh, and is kind of much more precise in a way. And you can see from the very beginning they measure the logs and they choose logs specifically. Uh, and so when they're loaded onto this conveyor belt, they're not put through a chipper, but instead they're shaved. Okay, so all the bark is taken off. Okay. Um, and they're turned into kind of perfect logs. Okay, ideal logs. And <clears throat> Let's see, after this, oh, this part I really like. Uh, there are these massive steel blades cut it down to eight foot lengths, okay? <clears throat> but the most amazing part of the manufacturing process is something called a peeler. <clears throat> and what happens is the logs are spun around at incredibly high speeds and a blade comes and just slowly gets closer and closer until it shaves the entire log into one long sheet. And here's an illustration, right? So this massive blade comes out, shaves it into this really thin sheet, which is, you know, the thickness of cardboard. Um, but the reason, or what, what kind of an amazing result of this, and here's one more shot, one more shot. Um, so, an amazing result of this is that it keeps the wood grain, which is structural. Uh, and if you then glue these sheets of wood grain at 90 degrees to each other, you get this incredibly um, durable, strong, really three-dimensional material. Now, let's, to kind of understand uh, masonite and plywood better, let's compare two works from Dia uh, on your right is Donald Judd's Untitled from, what, 1974, uh, ni sorry, 1976, and on the left is E.B. Noble's Room 19. Now, like, <clears throat> like many of Judd's other works, Untitled is a set of 15 boxes of equal proportion, each a variation on a constant form. And in his landmark essay, Specific Objects, which many of you <clears throat> are probably familiar with, Donald Judd describes his choice of industrially manufactured materials as being simply materials. Formica, aluminum, cold rolled steel, plexiglass, red and common brass, and so forth. They are specific. If they are used directly, they are more specific. There is an objectivity 
to the obdurate identity of a material. Now, for Judd, leaving this ex plywood raw, leaving it exposed, okay, um, allows it to be more direct and specific, but, but it also allows us to understand plywood as a three-dimensional thing. Right? So you can see in the construction of the work that the plywood is exploited for its structural integrity. The particular characteristics of the material actually dictate the form of the work. Right? Leaving the work unpaint unpainted allows us to clearly understand that the work adheres to a strict ethic of truth to materials. Um, now, the other reason to leave plywood raw okay, is that it establishes a relationship to the scale of the viewer. Uh, here in my little illustration I made, uh, on the right is a cube made of masonite, on the left is a cube made of plywood. Now, this could really be any scale. It could be as large as a monument, or it could be as small as a die that you hold in your hand, whereas this automatically, from the start, establishes scale. So here's another view of that illustration. Uh, I, I spent so long making that. <laughs> but but don't, you, don't you always picture Jacques Tati like, walking through Dia? Anyway. Uh, <clears throat> all right. So, if, if you're not familiar with Room 19 on permanent display at Dia Beacon, it is a work comprised of 77 elements, each constructed primarily of masonite brand fiberboard. There are panels, boxes, structural supports, and a variety of other polygons. The shapes in Room 19 vary in scale dramatically. Here you can see some of the smaller parts sitting on top of other parts. Many of the shapes in room 19 resembles, resemble paintings or sculptures that have yet to be made. Some objects look like plinths or pedestals or platforms. Others look like buildings or tombstones or ancient tablets. Still others resemble game pieces or utensils or generic industrial forms. The scale varies from the size of a puzzle piece to the scale of a long couch. The sheer Variety makes one think that almost any shape from all of culture could fit into one of these boxes. Um, and at first appearance, it might seem that Knobel's use of masonite lends itself to a similar reading as specific. Certainly, masonite is specific in the sense that it is common industrially manufactured commodity. But there are a number of key differences in Knobel's use of engineered wood that clue us in to an entirely different understanding of material, and by extension, an entirely different understanding of art, not to mention politics and aesthetics and the viewer. <clears throat> so Knobel does not use masonite for its structural integrity. In fact, masonite, the masonite is only an eighth inch integrity. You can see here lumber is used as a structural support. Masonite is a surfacing material. It covers up and encloses. It is used to make hollow doors, to cover walls. Um, but what is perhaps most important is that it is visually generic. It's plain, even boring, calls little attention to its status as natural. And unlike plexiglass or formica, the color is not intended to create visual effect attractive to product designers or retailers, the color of masonite is simply a byproduct of a manufacturing process. It is designed to be painted over. We might say then that Knobel is not interested in masonite for its status as specific and three-dimensional, but instead he understands it as a veneer, a semblance, a shield, a cover, or a substrate. Now, if Artists such as Judd, Sarah, and Andre strove to create work that was fully present, that embodied material truth, where each object is without illusion, a thing in and of itself, then what was Knobel's project? As Judd himself put it, three dimensions are real space that gets rid of the problem of illusionism and of literal space, one of the salient and most objectionable relics of European art. Well, Emi Knobel was European. <clears throat> And uh, perhaps these kind of explicit references to painting 
show an attachment to the European tradition that the others had left behind. And he was also a, only a master's student when he created Room 19. Perhaps he was simply not as advanced as his American counterparts who were slightly older. And given that there's no imminent relationship between the material and the form of the work, and given that there are hidden structural elements, is Knobel, like his material choice, a cheap imitation? Did he simply not get it? Did he just make work that looks like minimalism while completely misunderstanding the whole premise? Stay tuned. <laughs> Go, come back next week, I'll tell you. <laughs> um, this uh, 2006 advertisement for the Sony PlayStation 3 video game console neatly summarizes the dominant understanding of material abstraction. On the one hand, you have the analog chess piece lying prostate on the floor, kind of victim of the specifically analog conditions of gravity and physical reality. It's without a doubt a three-dimensional thing. It's material. Right? In direct contrast to this, you have you have the ominously floating black box, a digital device containing unseen secret powers. It's floating, vertical, dominant, weightless, virtual. It's becoming an image. The box has entered a realm beyond the limits of our material conditions. The box is transcending into pure geometrical space. It is an idea, a logo, idealism. Now, am I my kind of illustration, you, in minimalism, you would have the black box on the floor, <laughs> painting on the, well, I, you get the idea. Um, <laughs> so, but to kind of nuance our understanding uh, a bit, um, and to nuance our understanding of this binary, uh, let's, let's return to Judd's work at Dia, okay? So, the boxes are standardized, and um, you have this kind of logic of Fordist production, right? And it appears as though no human could have possibly crafted these perfect boxes. They are just one thing after another, as though they have rolled off the assembly line like so many brand new shiny Cadillacs. The boxes are standardized, and one would assume that the size of the box has a direct relation to this. Right? to this mechanical assembly line manufacturing process. One would assume that the material dimensions, too, are dictated by industry standards. Um, but of course, as we know, none of this is true. Boxes are not made in a factory. They do not adhere to standard material dimensions. They are not even the result of any division of labor whatsoever. They are made by single, individual, highly skilled craftsmen who Judd contracted. Now, what were these craftsmen contracted to do? What they were contracted to do is to create a perfect image of Fortis factory production. This is why Judd had so much trouble producing the work. He notori notoriously had to send the work back because it wasn't perfect. And what were Judd's standards of perfection? It had to look as though nobody had touched the thing. It had to give the illusion that it was a machine machine made. Now, this in no way devalues Judd's work for me. <clears throat> Judd's stagecraft was necessary. Actual real world manufacturing is messy and prone to error and glitches. Just look at all the recent product recalls. Perhaps the ideal conditions of perfect factory pr production could only have been staged. I'm also fascinated as to why and how the solution was constructed. And I'm particularly interested in the fact that even though I know all of this, even though you, all of us, have known all of this, um, when I'm in front of these boxes, I suspend disbelief. They're still perfect. Now, <clears throat> the reason Judd's boxes had to be perfect is the work has to be perfectly mute. Errors or glitches in manufacturing would have become sites of potential meaning. Instead, the perfection of the boxes allows meaning to be deflected back onto the real of the viewing experience. 
And this, of course, is minimalism's greatest contribution. What this understanding of Judd's work does change is the simplistic binary that he himself set up between the real and the illusionistic. And I don't mean that we should invert the hierarchy. We should not declare with postmodern zeal that it's all a big illusion, man. Um, I don't subscribe to the privileged position that everything is a simulacrum, and we are not all just avatars in a video game. I'm simply saying that one thing I learned from Amy Knobel's work is that the real manifests itself in unexpected, slippery, often counterintuitive ways. That there are times when the thing versus the image of the thing, that this binary is no longer secure. discovered in room 19 is a parasitic alien capable of perfectly imitating its victims. To name just a few of these victims, there is painting, sculpture, the artist's studio, architecture, and the classroom. <clears throat> but perhaps, I can't read that one. <laughs> but perhaps it is the museum that is the warmest place to hide. <laughs> now, room 19 is not the opposite of form. It is not what Robert Morris called anti-form. It is not material strewn about or a blob which collapses under the force of gravity. To quote Kurt Russell as R.J. McReady, the thing doesn't want to show itself. It wants to hide inside an imitation. Room 19 hides inside existing forms only to kill them, evacuating them of all meaning. And where does this thing come from? <clears throat> As a clue, we might look to a series of 54 images that Knobel has exhibited alongside Room 19. The title translates as Starry Sky, this is a series of photographs of outer space. On each image, Knobel has hand-painted a single star, succinctly conflating outer and inner space. But what is this thing? What is this thing that does not want to be seen, that hides inside an imitation? Perhaps another clue can be found in the project of Knobel's, in which he loaded a projector onto the back of a truck and drove it around the city, projecting a giant X onto the landscape. Instead of meaning, we are provided with a placeholder, a variable. X is nothing. Pr 
projected onto everything, nothing and everything succinctly mapped onto each other. <clears throat> and yet another clue as to how the thing manifests itself might be found in a series of works with the wonderful title Sandwich. In Sandwich, plywood is still a thing, but in an uncanny reversal, it is the thing itself which hides the illusion. For Knobel, plywood is not specific, but psychedelic. The manufacturing process of plywood in which a wood log is peeled creates a pattern of wood grain that repeats every 360 degrees, right? So every time the log spins, you get that same repetition of where the branches once were and of the wood grain. <clears throat> the natural grain of the wood is enhanced, while at the same time the panel looks like an image of wood, as though a photograph of wood grain had been printed multiple times across the, si across the surface. Plywood <clears throat> is psychedelic in the sense that the grain has swirly repeating patterns, but also in the sense that one is seeing something that is not fully present nature as an image of itself. <clears throat> Yet, sandwich is not an image. <clears throat> if framing is typically meant to separate an image from its context in order to enhance illusion, the painted color along the outer edges of sandwich does the opposite. It induces a heightened awareness of context. This is reiterated in the exposed mechanism of installation. The hanging hardware breaks through the surface of the picture plane. This not only establishes the objectness of the artwork, but emphasizes that the work is composed of layers, layers of veneer, which are not glued together, but are simply hung on top of each other. It emphasizes that there are layers of the sandwich which are hidden from view. And in a final reversal of thing and image, the outer edge of sandwich glows in the dark. <laughs> Weird move, but one of the best glow in the dark paintings ever, really. Um, now, when the lights are shut out, the thing reveals itself, but as a frame. <clears throat> Perhaps another clue as to what this thing is can be found in the text written by Marianne Brower, entitled For Emi and Carmen. It refers to Kazimir Malevich's painting, Black Square, from 1915. It is a painting against metaphysics. In its substance, matter, and mass, the black square that isn't a perfect square absorbs like a black hole all language, all worldviews. It absorbs and renders silent, but it does not kill I mean, it does not kill speech or existence by denying a representational world. For by its counterpart radiation, the white nothingness suddenly opens up to us, like an explosion of the eye, the existence of another logic in which everything paradoxically lives and lives therein. Because the painting is so precise, because it isn't the rendering of the thought of the square, it's not a geometrical abstraction, it is a reality. It is a world seen, not a mathematical, idealist, immaterial painting of per perfection. <clears throat> now, if Judd's perfectionism makes every physical aspect of the object legible and visible, then Knobel's method does the opposite. Every aspect of Room 19 is specifically designed to resist totalization. <clears throat> room 19 is never fully itself. Perhaps the most important aspect of the work is that the 77 elements may be reinstalled depending on the context of the exhibition and at the discretion of the artist. And here's the current installation at DIA and this is the previous installation, uh, which was installed by Helen Mira in conjunction with Emi. I think, I don't know what kind of 
in conjunction, but it was, uh, and then this is the original installation uh, from 1987. Um, and, <clears throat> but to complicate matters, uh, room nine, uh, there are actually three versions of room 19. <clears throat> and here are views of some of the other versions. This is the recent installation, right? It's recent. Yeah, but even if we were to limit ourselves <clears throat> to speaking about one room 19, say the first iteration which resides at Dia, the boundaries of what constitutes the work remain elusive. Uh, this is evident in the fact that we are never shown the entire work. In every installation view I could find, there are some elements that are hidden. There are elements stacked on top of other elements. It is work that refuses to fully disclose at the same time that it overwhelms with an overabundance of particulars. Instead of totalization, Room 19 offers an accumulation of fragments. Instead of an aesthetic specimen that we can dissect with the tools of disinterest, we have a set of variables with no clear distinction between inside and outside, visible and hidden, image and thing, artwork and context. Now, as I mentioned earlier, what makes a Judd box so effective is that the work is perfectly mute. There are no marks of subjectivity. Uh, it looks as though no human could have made the work. One of the ways he accomplished this was to rid his objects of traditional artistic composition in which various parts of the work have dynamic relationships. Um, so for example, in this de Kooning work, the dynamic relationships between the various parts are the site of supposed meaning and free expression. Uh, but with Judd, it's just boom, the thing. Composition is replaced with systems and sequences, one thing after another. Meaning is not located in the work, but in the physical experience of traversing the work. Now, oddly, room 19 returns composition to the artwork. Uh, the various parts can be rearranged, creating new relationships between the parts. Uh, and there's seemingly no system. The, arrangement, the arrangements are just based on subjective decisions. It's not like a solid where you have the instructions on how exactly to arrange it. Um, again, we have to ask, did Knobel just not get it? Was he still tied to the Euro tra European tradition of painting? And was he insisting that meaning be located in the expressive potential of composition? And in a sense, and I, and I think this may actually be uh, a reading of Noble that um, has been taken, um, but because in some respects, Noble is a painter. Um, and here's an example of one of his paintings. Uh, but I don't believe he saw composition as a site of supposed free expression. Um, instead, Knobel re refers to the rearrangement of the shapes in room 19 as an event, relating his practice to fluxus, performance, and chance. Um, evidence of chance methods of composing uh, can be found throughout Knobel's entire practice. A painting such as this one appears as though, it appears to me at least, as though it was derived um, from maybe the chance procedure of dropping pieces of paper on the floor and then tracing their contour, um, these as well. And this, some other kind of method that, and I don't know this specifically, seems to be at work in, in uh, his monumental work now uh, currently installed at DIA um, entitled 24 Colors for Blinky. <clears throat> um, There is also his superb anti-compositional work entitled Gento Room, in which shapes are simply piled up as th though they are waiting to be composed. 
hear it. This is unbelievable. Or, Now, in the case of room 19, though, I can't imagine that the work is composed based on any degree of chance. Uh, the size and weight of the objects would make uh, it too cumbersome, and arrangement has to be calculated to a certain degree. Um, this photograph is from 1968, uh, from the classroom at the Dusseldorf Academy, uh, in which he originally created and installed the work. Uh, you can see it's a nice picture. Um, perhaps event is the wrong word. Perhaps it's more useful to think of composition in room 19 as a score or a kind of writing, arranging polygons as a form of notation, like a three-dimensional version of the graphic notation of John Cage. Yeah. In any configuration, room 19 functions as a pictogram or rebus. The word rebus comes from res, the Latin word for things. Here the things are set down as a code to be deciphered. Yet without a key, we are left only with evocations, implications, and fields of connotation. Rearranging the elements produces new meanings. One arrangement creates a storeroom. Another resembles a stage set. Another a game board, a monument, a graveyard, a trade show, a museum, studio, retail store, classroom, factory, data graph, architectural model, sign shop, or storage room. <clears throat> now, now, Campbell was among a number of other artists in the 1960s and 70s, extending the materialist practice of minimalism outwards to address the exhibition space itself. Robert Smithson even referred to this as the great project of the 1970s. Now, certain artists, such as Daniel Buren, Michael Asher, Hans Hacke, extended Judd's anti-illusionist dogma, the absolute binary of illusion versus material reality was maintained and expanded. Now, for Buren and others, the exhibition framework does not promote free expression, but is actually a cover for oppressive social and economic policies. Art was being used to create the illusion that we live in a free society when, in fact, we do not. The white walls, the controlled lighting, the sanitary tranquility of the gallery are all constructed in order to naturalize and mythologize a system of economic and social inequality. The idea was that expressive art could never redeem the repressive mechanisms of society as a whole. Now, by 1970, Daniel Buren had militantly proclaimed that art, whatever else it may be, is exclusively political. What is called for is the analysis of formal cultural limits within which art exists and struggles. These limits are many and of different intensities. And although it is too early to blow them up, the time has come to unveil, it, uh, unveil them. Well, you know, it's pretty intense. OK. Now, given how different the situation is today, what is our great project? I'm not sure if I'm. <laughs> <laughs> so ambitious to answer that question. Um, but perhaps room 19 provides a more useful model for us. Um, perhaps, perhaps the job of the artist from this perspective, from the perspective given by room 19, is to probe the slippery often paradoxical distinctions between literal and metaphysical limits. In room 19, the gallery walls are not an obstacle to freedom, but an absolute limit. The history of art and objects, of culture itself, 
<clears throat> define the boundaries that can never be passed, overcome, or blown up. Through Room 19, we understand that there is no outside of culture. There is no space beyond the object or beyond commodification. Um, you can't just pick up and go to Marfa. <laughs> <clears throat> and in some respects, Room 19 is a Kafkaesque nightmare in which we are trapped inside the institutional framework. And it is trapped inside us. It is a space of totalizing interiority mapped onto the exterior. In a sense, Room 19 re-centers the subject, but at a steep cost. The institution and the viewing subject collapse upon each other as in a hall of mirrors. We are trapped inside an isolation chamber, an infinite loop of echoes and repetitions. Yet, what redeems the work, for me, is the strange texture of the experience in front of it. No aspect of the work ever sits comfortably as an image of a thing or as a thing itself. Room 19 is that strange space between our little, literal and metaphysical limits. <clears throat> Room 19 is a model or map, but paradoxically, it is a model at a one-to-one -one scale. And to end my talk, I'd like to play um, a short story by Borges, which speaks to just such a paradoxical situation. The rigor in the En aquel imperio, el arte de la cartografía logró tal perfección que el mapa de una sola provincia ocupaba toda una ciudad y el mapa del imperio toda una provincia. Con el tiempo, esos mapas desmesurados no satisfacieron y los colegios de cartógrafos levantaron un mapa del imperio que tenía el tamaño del imperio y coincidía puntualmente con él. Menos adictas al estudio de la cartografía, las generaciones siguientes entendieron que ese dilatado mapa era inútil y no sin piedad lo entregaron a las inclemencias del sol y de los inviernos. En los desiertos del oeste perduran despedazadas ruinas del mapa, habitadas por animales y por mendigos. En todo el país no hay otra reliquia de las disciplinas geográficas. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> talk a little fast. We have some time for debate and questions, but. So, Daniel, do you really think the great project is the... <laughs> I just want to go back to the Genta room, because I didn't, it didn't quite come into my talk so much, but it's really a remarkable uh, piece. different numbers of parts. And actually, one of them also has a giant glow-in-the-dark um, part to it. <laughs> Another, I don't know if I have a shot of it, but it's like a giant cube made of phosphorescent panels. Um, but, yeah. All right. Uh, 
I actually feel like I've entered a hall of mirrors. <laughs> okay, thanks very much. So there's some direct references to voice there too. Yeah. Yeah. But. Um, there seems to be some suggestion that the uh, the objects don't have the same fixedness of say um, any of the actual artists. Uh, artists. I mean, in some ways it's kind of like um, like Franz West, even though it's quite different. But it's like the suggestion in the movement that it's not this kind of dead object. Yeah. I mean, is that something? Yeah, that's interesting. Um, and then with the layers as well, it's just, you know, it's like there's something, something behind. Yeah, that there's always a potential, um, that there's a potential like, embedded in all of the objects. Not sure. And I guess it, maybe it feels that way, even if you don't know that it can be rearranged. When you walk in, it feels like a workshop um, like things are being constructed, things are being made, they could change at any point. Um, which, yeah. yeah. Um, which also maybe speaks to the kind of um, like pointing towards infinity uh, that, that's present that I tried to address. So, yeah. thinking a lot about sawdust. <laughs> uh, and I, th I mean, this kind of composite wood and its ability to take any form like, establishes it always as an image already because it's like there's no inherent uh, scale embedded in it. Um, <clears throat> And I'm also, I've also been struggling, and I, you know, I, I only brought up kind of Buren, Hakka, and these guys, because I've been kind of struggling with my own uh, notion of what are the politics of making art that addresses the, the space, the architecture, the literal architecture. Because the danger is, the danger when you do, um, address the architecture is that you're just aestheticizing institutional critique. Or worse, you're just, it's kind of like a moot point and you're rehearsing 
it. So are those the only two op options for um, like addressing the context of the gallery? Um, and I think Room 19 provides a model, an, uh, um, another model where, there, where it's not, where the binary kind of collapses in on itself. Um, but, you know, but it's slippery and dangerous territory that I like to play in. So. Is he, do you, do I, I think his work is funny. Do I think he thinks his work is funny? I don't know. <laughs> Actually, a lot of the interviews do have in parentheses laughing. You know how they do that, right? So you can tell he's laughing, but um, you know. But he also makes reference to uh, Malevich all the time, which is like to me the most self-serious. Uh, project ever so I mean you can't yeah you can't make glow in the dark work without a sense of humor <laughs> yeah.